Welcome to note set number 37 where we're going to talk about some uses of Bode plots. So in the last video we learned a little bit about how to actually do Bode plots. So now let's uh, see what they can help us do. So let's revisit our old friend simple RC low pass filter. Uh, we've already seen uh, the uh, the transfer function, frequency response of that, uh, and we, uh, you know, have made nice, pretty plots of that. But now we know from a, a, a Bode diagram po point of view, um, we know that we have a um, a single pole. We know that our 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 breakpoint is going to be one over R C. Um, so um, we can figure out whatever our R C value is. We put that here and we know that this thing is going to go flat across until we hit the breakpoint and then it's going to go down and the slope will be minus 20 dB per decade. Um, so that's exactly what we've seen um, in, in you know a few video lectures ago and that's what we've seen in our Bode plot um, ideas so um, a lot of things are being tied together here and hopefully that's uh, helping you see how all of this works. Uh, we've also seen the RC high pass filter. Uh, remember that had a, a an S term up there, same same denominator. Um, so remember that S term up there uh, gets grouped with the constant out in front. So we start with a plus 20 dB per decade, uh, and then we hit a break point. Here's our break point, and that gives us a minus 20 dB per decade change. So we were at plus and then we change by minus 20 uh, and we end up with a slope of, of 0 dB per decade. Um, so it's, it's um, very clear now why these circuits are behaving the way that they are. Um, so you know it's, it's not inconceivable for you to get to the point where you can look at these simple transfer functions and go, oh, I see, um, yeah, it starts up, then breaks, got it. Um, so uh, you know, again, if you're aiming for um, analog circuit design uh, type jobs. Um, those are the kinds of things that you might get asked during your interview and you don't really want to stumble on that. Uh, especially given that these are pretty uh, important but yet quite um, simple to deal with um, issues. <clears throat> now we also saw um, second order RLC bandpass filter that looked like that and we saw three different cases of that. And when so when we had the uh, uh, two complex poles with a zeta equal to 0.1, um, it was easy. And, and remember, we have we have an S here, um, so that S starts us off um, at going up at plus 20 dB. Then we hit our breakpoint, assuming here that our breakpoint is at at a thousand, which it is. Uh, we hit our breakpoint, and then we switch we lose 40 dB so we were going up at plus 20 then we hit a minus 40 so we're left at at minus 20 so we went up at plus 20 down at minus 20 um, but notice that the actual plot is quite a bit higher well that's going to be 14 dB higher because our zeta was equal to 0.1 um, so we have this little resonant peak there um, so that's one way to to visualize that um, so then the next uh, scenario was zeta equal to 1 uh, that has the repeated roots um, so now we have two real poles right here um, and so again we start going up at plus 20 then we hit a double double pole so it's a double whammy so we get a minus 20 from one a minus 20 from the other and we immediately start heading south at um, minus 20 dB now because we've lost 40 dB um, and there is no um, resonant correction um, but one thing that um, ends up happening is that we end up getting a, a, a little bit above there because of the um, just you know uh, um, we show going a little bit above that but in reality when you have a double pole you you back off 6 dB um, and so we see the actual uh, performance very easily and then the third case um, is the two distinct poles um, one at 172 and um, one at 5828 so I've, I've drawn uh, these vertical lines here at uh, a 
approximately 172 and 5,828. Uh, and so what ends up happening there is, again, the single S up there gives us the plus 20. Then we hit the first pole. Um, let's say A is, is at 172. So we hit the first pole at 172, and we lose 20, so now we're flat. Then we uh, stay flat until we hit the second pole at 58.28, and we lose another 20, and we go down at minus 20. So Bode plots tells us uh, how all three of these should behave um, and it's no surprise that we get the resonant peak there because of the uh, quite severe under damping. So these things are really powerful. Now suppose we decide, you know what, I want to build a better bandpass filter. So we, you know, we go back here and we realize all of these just give us 20 dB up and 20 dB down. Not a very selective bandpass filter. Suppose I want 40 um, in both of those places. I want a faster roll-off is how a, uh, you know, a working engineer might say that. Um, so I know that I need an S-squared term in my numerator and I also know, uh, and, and maybe we want this to be a fairly broad one, so I, I know that I need to go um, um, change from plus 40 to 0 here, so I, I, I need a double pole at omega 1, um, a double real pole at omega 1, and then I need to switch and go down minus 40, so I need another double pole um, there. So I actually need um, a transfer function that has an s squared in the numerator and then has um, two double poles, two different double poles. Um, down in the denominator. So there's the transfer function of what I need. Um, and there are several ways that we can get this. We'll, t we'll talk about three ways that we can um, actually implement this based upon things that we already know. Um, so we can factor it this way so that we have uh, one term uh, that has an, S, uh, an omega 1 and an omega 2. So one term that has two distinct poles and another term that has two distinct poles. And since they are multiplying each other, we can think of that as a cascade of two different systems. Uh, a second way to do it is to group the, the two double poles. Uh, so group a double pole and group a double pole. So again, cascade of two systems. First system has a double pole, second system has a double pole. Um, and in each of those cases, we would have a single zero um, in each of those. Um, so those are actually uh, the exact same circuits, just different choices of the RLC values. Uh, and then another possibility is um, to build a high-pass filter, um, an RLC circuit with uh, repeated poles, where we have a, a, an S squared in the numerator. So remember we talked about a, a, the S squared being there. Um, well. Um, it, it's pretty easy to, to establish that with an S squared and a, a squared pole down there that that gives us a high pass filter. Uh, and then we're going to follow with a second order uh, low pass filter um, that looks like this. So basically we would be building one high pass filter that goes like this, cascaded with um, one high pass filter that goes like this. Um, and so the cascade of those two um, will give us a, a, a bandpass filter. So, um, so we could cascade two RLC circuits like this to try to get this ca uh, to get this um, uh, type of filter. Now the problem is that our our theory says that this will work because obviously we've determined the transfer function of that and we've determined the transfer function of that. The problem is that when we determine the transfer function of the first one, we assumed there was nothing hanging on to the output of that. But now, as soon as we put this thing here, um, all of these components show up in parallel um, with that resistor. And um, that then uh, perturbs the analysis. Uh, and we, we would have to take that into account. Um, 
So, uh, so you have to be careful um, when cascading these passive circuits like that. Um, you still might be able to get this cascade to work, but you'd probably have to figure out how you have to tweak your component values. Um, so that would be a little bit of a, a, a tedious analysis. You'd have to figure out how all three of these contribute to the effect of, of this one. Um, but you might be able to work through it, but it would be quite uh, tedious um, and, and challenging. And an alternative is um, this idea of using an op amp as a buffer. And this is a huge idea in electronics and all sorts of circuits. Um, when you've got one circuit, and this doesn't come from the the mathematical theory we've been talking about. It comes from uh, you know circuit theory ideas. You've got one circuit. If you hang this unity gain buffer here, um, what we're seeing is that um, this op amp here gives us a high, very large input impedance here. Um, and so from the point of view of this circuit, it looks like there's close to an infinite impedance at this point and so that's effectively like nothing is being connected there and then on the other side um, we end up with a very small output impedance or out, output resistance uh, for this this op amp and so that makes it look like this bandpass second stage is being driven by an ideal source um, which is what we're always assuming uh, when we do our analysis of these things um, so ideal meaning that um, it's the source is Thevenin and resistance is, is effectively zero. So this buffer does exactly that. It buffers, it provides a buffer between these two um, circuits so that neither one influences the behavior of the other one. And, and that's a beautiful idea. Um, and depending on what you're going to drive this with, you might want to put another buffer here. And depending on what's going to be driving this, you might need another buffer there. Um, so there's a lot of uh, you know physical things to worry about when you're going through these electronics. So um, remember that this is a bandpass RLC, this is a bandpass RLC, and and there's two different ways that we could choose them. We could make each stage have repeated poles, um, or we could make each stage have distinct poles. Um, in which case uh, the distinct poles of this one and the distinct poles of this one would have to be identical. So um, in this approach we would have two identical circuits here, same RC value, RLC values. Um, now another way to make a, a bandpass filter still using uh, this buffer idea is to take a second order high pass RLC and a second order low pass RLC circuit and cascade them um, but again um, using the buffer so that um, the the two stages don't cause interaction between each other um, and so now you have to choose the components um, so that each stage has has repeated poles so all of these are workable ideas but they're not necessarily the most um, the most common, but it's a, a way of getting your feet wet and learning your way around. Um, so learning how to design circuits like this, and I'm by no means a, 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 a um, circuit designer. I, I'm really a DSP algorithm guy, um, but I know a little bit about this. Um, uh, but there are people who know the ins and outs of this backwards and forwards. Um, but uh, you know, here we're seeing that we need inductors, and inductors are not necessarily our favorite uh, design components um, because they can't really be made in silicon, and they're heavy and, and expensive and things like that. Um, so there are um, active filters where the the op amp is not just being used as a, a a standalone buffer, but is actually part of the filter. Um, and these are uh, just one possibility that I got from this this link from the Maxim company. Um, that's the integrated circuit company, not the magazine. Um, and so this is a second order high pass structure here, and this is a second order low pass structure here. Um, and um, there is isolation between them because of the low input impedance of, of the uh, op amp there um, is not causing any impact of this. And um, the large input impedance of this is, is isolating um, this part from affecting the, the, the first part.
Um, so you ought to take a look at these things, um, you know, if you're going down uh, that road of, of career path, you ought to be learning about those kinds of things. Let's look at one last design example that shows how um, knowing about Bode plots can help us figure out what we want. So suppose we decide we want to make a some sort of treble booster for an electric guitar. Now I've, I've not designed and experimented with this circuit at all so I don't know whether this would sound good or not but let's just use it as a as an example. So suppose we decide that um, we don't want any gain up to a hundred and then from a thousand on we want 20 dB of gain and and we're willing to allow to have a you know a kind of a, a, a increasing gain from a hundred to a thousand. Um, so I've set this up yeah it's kind of you know trumped up so that we end up we've changed a decade we've gone 20 dB um, so um, that's 20 dB per decade so we're all set up to do easy Bode plot ideas um, but this is a, a good starting point and then once you get an initial design you keep tweaking and refining it um, so from a Bode plot point of view um, well let me back up so a string on a on a guitar is about 110 Hertz so um, and the a note on the 17th fret of the high E string has a fundamental of 880 um, so um, that just gives you a perspective of, of where those frequencies lie relative to a guitar again I don't know whether this would sound good at all uh, anyway, from our, our uh, knowledge of Bode plots, we now can see that um, you know w we have a breakpoint at 100 where we need to go up by 20 dB. Uh, we have a breakpoint at 1,000 where we have to lose 20 dB. So th this needs to be a pole. This needs to be a zero. Um, and we're doing things in terms of omega, so we better convert 100 and 1,000 hertz into radians per second. Um, so we, we have omega 1 is the smaller, um, that's the, the 0, so we, we go up, then we hit the pole second, and so then it, it, it takes off that, that slope. So we know what our structure needs to look like. The question is, how do we get a circuit that gives us um, this transfer function or equivalently this frequency response? So that's the big question. So, well, we just start playing around um, and, you, you know, guided playing around. We say, well, uh, let's, I want to be using capacitors here. I want to stay away from inductors. So let's just start off playing around with a simple series combination of, of an R and C. So we find out what that impedance is, and we go, okay, R plus 1 over CS. Um, and we say, well, we could have gotten an R plus SL with an inductor, but we, we want to avoid those. But we've seen over and over that, you know, those these S's down here get flopped up um, algebraically to become, uh, you know, S's in, in, in various polynomials. So uh, let's charge onward, and, and we ask ourselves, what would happen if we could somehow get a transfer function that was the ratio of these two of two different impedances like this? And so we look at this and we, we, we form that ratio and then we do a little bit of algebra and we go, aha, you know, there's my zero, there's my pole. But now this is just a ratio of two impedances. It's not a transfer function. Um, so um, we realize that's what we want, but we don't have a transfer function yet. But then, um, you know, so we, we know how to pick the R1, C1, R2, and C2 to give us the right things. So, okay, great. So we've got this ratio of impedances, but still no transfer function. But then we go, well, okay, I know that uh, an inverting op amp gives me a gain, which is effectively its transfer function, um, of the ratio of two resistances. Um, when these are resistors, if I replace those with impedances, my gain, which again, remember, is output relative to input in terms of uh, Laplace, that this will just be um, S domain impedance and S domain impedance. So if we plug those in and we imagine uh, putting that um, resistor capacitor series combination here and here we'd end up getting a gain that looks like this and and that negative sign out in front won't affect our magnitude it just affects an overall phase shift of 180 degrees so we hypothesize hey 
maybe this is the circuit that, that we need. Um, and we've already determined how to choose the R's and the C's for this um, to get our desired frequency points. And, and at that point, maybe we're super delighted. And then we go and think about this a little more carefully. And we go, well, OK, so again, like I've been telling you, think about what happens at lowest frequencies, what happens at highest frequencies. So at low frequencies, down near DC, this thing is acting like an open circuit. So at very low frequencies, it's as if this is open. And we never really want to run an op amp um, open, open loop. Um, so what that would do is cause any tiny little amount of, of um, voltage noise here gets amplified incredibly large. Um, and any real signal that is showing up here is going to be amplified so much that will drive the op amp to saturate at its um, positive and negative supply voltages. Um, and, and this problem is pointed out on page 98 of a book called The Art of Electronics. And if you want to be an electronic circuit designer, whether it's analog or digital, it, it covers both, uh, this ought to be on your bookshelf. So you ought, you ought to check it out. And there is a newer version of that, but I have the 1980 version of it. So we go back to the drawing board and then we say, well, there was that non-inverting version of the op amp. Let's try that. Uh, that has a one out in front. And so now we say, well, I know that I can't have um, an R and a C there. So let me um, just make it an R and, and see what I get. And maybe that'll give me some insight into what I, what I can do. And so we try that, and we um, you know, put in our impedances there, and we do a little bit of algebra, and we work this out, and we go, aha, there is exactly what we want. I've got a one pole in the denominator, one zero in the numerator, um, and that's exactly what I want. And I have enough component flexibility here to set um, one RC value to get where to place my pole where I want it, and then I've got um, flexibility to set RF um, to give me um, where my zero needs to be. And so, yes, indeed, I can choose these component values. Um, I've chosen those according to standard uh, available components. And then I make a nice plot of that. And the, the slight discrepancy here is because I've used standard values, so I'm not getting exactly uh, the exact pole zero placement that I wanted, but pretty close. Um, and so to just summarize this, um, you know, we've gained a lot of insight from Bode plots, and you've gained a lot of insight from circuits class about building blocks that you have available to you. Um, and you gain some, you, you've gained a lot of insight in your electronics class about op amps and um, some of the drawbacks of using them. Um, so we threw all that in a in a big blender, played around with it a little bit, scrutinized our design to see if there were any overlooked problems. Um, we discovered, um, well, I say two problems, uh, really only only one problem um, that we needed to fix, um, and uh, um, we tried an alternate version of the circuit and got a non-inverting form of the op amp uh, to give us exactly what we wanted. Um, and so, um, you know, that just shows the power of having Bode plot knowledge together with circuit knowledge. Uh, and that's the end of this video lecture, and I will see you in the next one. Thanks.